30 odd years ago, I built a guitar and my deal with myself was that I was going to build a guitar and then learn to play it. And I think playing it might have been more the attractant than building it, but at any rate, I, I built a guitar and I went up the learning curve a lot as I was doing the work and I subsequently burned it in my driveway. Um, so I never had to learn to play. And I realized along the way that there was probably an opportunity for somebody who wanted to supply wood uh, for a guitar maker. So after that, I, I wrote to all the guitar makers in the world and uh, started supplying wood to a, a few small builders. Dake Traphagen in, in Bellingham was one, and, and Dake helped me a lot in understanding what builders wanted. And, and so I, I nibbled away at it for a while, just doing that on the side, teaching, working trail crews also for the Park Service. And prior to that time, I'd, I'd worked in logging, so I, I, ha I understood wood from a tree point of view, and I also knew enough about woodworking from making small boats and, and some furniture and other things, teaching, that um, I had the skill sets necessary, unremarkable skill sets, but when combined, uh, they made it possible to figure out how to cut wood for instruments. Cedar, which is what I started with, could be obtained by buying shake blocks, two foot long split blocks that are perfect for guitar tops, shape-wise. Uh, you could buy those from mills for two or three times what they were worth to the mill and just pick through and get the ones that had good color and, and were um, sufficiently straight and sufficient ring count and so forth. So that was easy and that's what I did for a while. And and then there, I, I thought about spruce and spruce was a harder nut to crack because the logs were expensive. They were export logs. And once you take a spruce log that's expensive and cut it into two foot rounds, split it into blocks, you have no value unless you have useful instrument material. So spruce, there was a higher barrier to entrance, but what I could do, what was Wild West, was you could still buy from the Forest Service a permit to cut firewood or to make special products. And those permits were, were comparatively inexpensive. And so I cut Engelman spruce, for example, on, on the pass here um, on a firewood permit. And I talked to the ranger, told him what I wanted to do. And, and he said, yeah, you can do that. You can get two cords. So, so I did. And that, that was how I started with Engelman. Sitka, I started, uh, I found some blowdown on the Olympic Peninsula. I bought, I remember, one tree for, um, bought three blowdowns for, $51. I had to backpack them out, wheelbarrow them out, so forth. But it was comparatively inexpensive. And, and then I went to Alaska for better pickings at Spruce and was able again to buy uh, some small blowdown sales up there. Maple is it's quite, um, it's a prolific wood. It grows from San Diego County uh, all the way through Washington up to Prince Rupert on the coast. And it grows into the Sierras, it grows into the Cascades. Uh, it's in rainforests, but it's also in some, some drier locales. That's Western big leaf maple. Um, what I noticed early on is there were two kinds of figure we would see. We would see kind of reaction figure that would be uh, under a big limb or in a tree that was somehow contorted. Uh, and occasionally we would find a nicer tree, a tree that had good form that um, was figured from the ground up to almost the tips of the branches. And, and 
And the other thing I, I noticed was that there were areas that were better for figure. You'd have trees in some areas that had no figure, and then you'd have this really uh, constant, a real concentration of figure in, in certain pretty um, compressed locales. Maple is systematically eradicated from all commercial forestry because nobody wants it. They'll take it as a bycatch, uh, and they'll, instead of salmon fillets, they'll make fish sticks out of it. But uh, when maple is fiddleback or quilted, it's very valuable, and, and people will pay a lot for that log, for instruments, for veneer, for, for different things. It turns out maple sprouts quite prolifically from stumps. And it's not always the case, but it's often the case. So three years ago, when uh, a local logger uh, brought in a wonderful piece of maple and uh, said, are you interested in this? I said, yes. And it was a, a tree that was taken out, um, it was on the grounds of the North, Northwest uh, Indian College, and they were doing a, a building expansion. So I thought, hmm, let's, we, we can't leave that there and let it sprout because it's going to become a building. But can we dig the stump up? So they let us, uh, we rented an excavator. The stump was big enough, I had to quarter it uh, with, with a chainsaw to, to load it brought it back, planted it, and waited for it to sprout. And uh, it did not. A year elapsed, and, and then the second summer, there were actually some sprouts that came out. And, and uh, so we thought, oh, this is something. And it, it was interesting, because the guys at work had just been starting to hound me about the stump. We've got 20 acres, but the, the 10 square feet that stump was taking was the most important patch of real estate we had. And can we get rid of that? Can we throw it out back? I said, no, no, let's wait. And that very day, it sprouted. What, what we have now going on is we have four different lines of figured maple under cultivation, trees whose stumps we have gotten. And, and so we know from the finished product, we know what the tree cut out to be, what the materials that came out of it were in terms of backs and sides, sometimes in terms of veneer as well. And so we have those growing in two different locations. So we're growing this material. We don't know if it will show the same genetic characteristics, but we have good reason to believe it will. And what we want to do is grow out a number of lines of figured maple, see how early we can spot that they are in fact figured and, and be able to ascertain that. Um, my vision for this is that in 40 years, I would love for this to be the valley where you can go to get figured maple and that there would be thousands of acres under cultivation here. But it won't be my acres. <laughs> <laughs>